I'm Martin Jarvis, and once again, I want to welcome you to listen. So everybody's talking about the Montgomery, Alabama brawl. I suppose that's what that's what uh, we're going to talk about today. I took a while, a few days, without commenting a word on social media, just to get my thoughts right, because I'm not sure where I want to go with this. Now, now to be honest with you, when I watched it. I was thrilled to see what went down, okay? Very thrilled. <laughs> okay. It, because it was right. Now, especially as a black man. But but even if he was he was just a white guy getting beat up by, by white guys, you would you would want someone to come to his aid and you would be happy. Nobody wants to see an innocent person get abused like that. Okay? First thing I want to say about that then is, do you think any of those white guys would have been so emboldened had they been by themselves and it was just between them and that guard? Of course not. Go figure, right? Something about numbers <laughs> emboldens them. Same, same thing about guns. It emboldens them. They would, they would do things. They would be a certain way. You know, that they wouldn't be ordinarily had they, had they not been in numbers or had the man not had a gun, okay? And so, so I do want to say that I that, that was thrilling to watch. Be, because what I think this is the beginning of is, is the beginning of seeing the illusion of white folks dissipate. The illusion of superiority. But at the same time, we're seeing the illusion of black folks as well dissipate. The illusion of inferiority. Okay? Uh, but, 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 you know, we're not there yet. These illusions are diminishing. And I think they're, they're not really illusions. Well, it could be an illusion. Like if you're a magician and you're preparing an illusion to fool some people, you know the truth, okay? And, and so, so in this day and age, the, the so-called white supremacists really know they're not supreme. It's, it's not like the illusion that's diminishing. It's that the cover of, of their, of the mask is beginning to be pulled away, okay? And so that's what we saw the other day. I think, I think it's been this way for a long time. I know I was a young man, and I was a military man in the 70s, high school student, graduated in 1976 and all, went to military uh, when I was 17. So, so I grew up in the 70s. I mean, I grew up from a boy to a man in the 70s. And at that time, white people were pretty much afraid of black people. I mean, that, that, this is why, historically, we have so much of this, this, the racism. We have so much prejudice. I don't even want to call it prejudice, because prejudice kind of gives you a feeling of an honest judgment of somebody that's just not correct. But these folks know. So it's not, it's not even prejudice. It's just, just <laughs> bullying when you can because of your own perceived inferiority. So, so I know this is like a psychological test here, but so, so it's not the, the person proclaiming themselves a white supremacist. They're really folks, they're really white folks that feel themselves inferior, but they're not willing to face it. So they're projecting this image of anger. We're not going to take it, you know, taking our country back, MAGA and all that kind of stuff. But really it's an individual who's inferior, okay, who feels inferior. Now, personally, I don't believe people are inferior or superior intrinsically, but, but because of your mindset, you can make yourself inferior. I think that has had a, a, lot, a lot of issues with a lot of black folks. You know, we're just talking about our nation pretty much today. In our nation today is, is that they feel inferior, okay? They, 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 they feel inferior to white folks. And, and there are many white folks that are simply like that little dog that really is not brave at all. But they sense, you know, your fear, so they're gonna play it all the way, all the way to the hilt. They're gonna be barking and acting all crazy until you stomp at them, and then they back up all crazy, 
all scared. So that's what you have. You have illusions going on. You have masks going on. You have, you have misunderstandings, you know, their self-perception. But a misunderstanding of your self-perception can create that within you. Now, a misunderstanding of, of your inferiority will not create a superiority. But, but a, a misunderstanding of, of, of your of your superiority as an inferiority can 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 bring you back you know to to mimic that which you perceive yourself to be <sighs> as a mouthful so 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 the point is that that we all eventually will come to a point of truth okay and again, those the white folks in the '70s they were afraid of black folks, man. And that's why that's why when uh, you know we all this talk about guns and the Second Amendment, Second Amendment, and all that. And don't get me wrong, I have more than my share of guns, probably more guns than most gun lovers. Okay, let me just put that out there first. But 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 you know this whole talk about Second Amendment. You know you know who kind of curtailed that? You know gun restrictions. President Ronald Reagan. You know the president so many conservatives love. Why? Because, because in Oakland, California, when Ronald Reagan was governor of California, the, the black folks, the Black Panthers for Self-Defense, began to challenge the police who were abusing the residents of Oakland. They, they began to come out there with their guns, with their rifles, and their law books. And, and any time a police officer stopped a black motorist, the, the Black Panthers would be there with gun in hand and a law book in hand. You had the Huey P. Newton, Bobby Seale, some of those brothers back there. And so, so as the Black Panthers were being getting armed, go ahead and Google them, Black Panthers with weapons or whatever. You'll see them standing on the courthouse steps, you know, wearing their black outfits, black berets and their rifles and all. So, so, so the reason we had stricter gun laws in so many places was because black people were beginning to embrace those laws and protect themselves. Okay, so don't get that twisted. And, and so what I'm suggesting is, it, it, as we began to uh, sort of curtail those restrictions, people began to, you know, appropriate guns. It, the guns brought to the white people who had been historically afraid of these black people. It gave them some boldness and some courage. That's why the old advertisement, you know, the way you'll get my gun is by prying my cold, dead fingers from the gun, you know. Imagine that. And, and really, I think all this could have been avoided. <laughs> all these emotions, all these attitudes over the decades, you know. If, if, if white folks had just simply admitted you know, to, 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 their, to their ills toward black people, I don't think black people were really looking for 40 acres and a mule. <laughs> I mean, eventually, they kind of figured that wasn't going to be happening. But, but... As well, there is an emotion within white people. See, see what you have here is when you have a, when you consciously wrong someone, you feel bad about it. I think Thomas Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson, no less. You know, my wife and daughter and I, we went to D.C. and we went to this little place where they had all these statues and the writings and the words of these great, you know, American. Uh, past people, heroes and all, and there was something, and I have to paraphrase this, but, but Thomas Jefferson made a statement to the fact that, that it was going to be a terrible day for, for the United States of America when, when they finally have to suffer for the ills that they've done to black slaves. <laughs> this, was, this was a man who had slaves. But he recognized it was wrong. And we do. We recognize when we do wrong. So, so they knew they were wrong. But, but like say, take a man and his wife, for example, okay? And, and he punches her a couple of times. Maybe he abuses her. And, and then he feels bad about it. And he feels real bad about it because he knows it was wrong. He knows he was able to overpower her. He feels bad. But he doesn't apologize. And he feels bad each day. Caesar feels guilty and bad. But, but if he doesn't make up for what he has done, if he doesn't make it right with her, eventually when he sees her, he's going to be resenting the bad feeling that it has caused within him. And, and eventually, rather than simply feeling bad, he's going to be resenting her because it's her presence that is causing that negative emotion to arise within him. 
But, but if he still doesn't deal with that situation, the resentment eventually is going to turn into anger because he's going to be getting angry because in her presence, he's always feeling that way. So he hasn't dealt with the sorrow. He hasn't dealt with the resentment. Now he's beginning to be angry every time he sees her. And, and if he hasn't dealt with that, eventually he'll become violent with her again because that anger will transcend to an action against this thing that's making him so angry, making him so uncomfortable. So, so we go full circle. And you're back to that violence again and have been maybe feeling sorry for it. So when you look at an entire society, this is where we're at. And, and so that, that battered wife is never really going to feel empowered. She is going to feel victimized. And she, and she is going to constantly feel victimized, never well, never comfortable, because at any time she could be hit again. Black people in this nation. So, so, so a lot of the negativity that, 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 that the white race has felt, the Caucasians have felt in this nation, was because of a deep, deep-seated guilt for never having made right that which they perpetrated among black people. And, and so, so, so a lot of times, so, so, so black folks don't really, white folks don't really hate black people. They just have these issues. Now, now it, you have to go deeper than conscious thought because there are things that, that we have dealt with inside that we have suppressed that, that have manifested in a particular conscious way. But, but if we look, so we, yeah, I do hate that person. But if we look at deeply what is motivating you to feel that way, it is not the negativity and anger and, and hate that you consciously exhibiting toward these people. There's a guilt inside that's just never been dealt with. And, and so I had to tell some folks, and I mentioned in the last program recently, you know, folks often are trying to justify themselves. You know, whenever I go someplace, a new place to work, and there are white folks there, it's like they seek me out and try to let me know that I'm like, they're not like the other white folks, you know. And they start pointing them out and telling on other white folks, you know. Y'all white folks don't know that, do you? But your own white friends are telling on you for the things you say and the things you do to black people to try to ingratiate themselves, to justify themselves, to even assuage some of their own internal guilt because they're still part of that collective, okay? And what I shared with this white woman uh, a couple of years ago that was telling me, you know, trying to tell me that she wasn't like that, but her daddy was, you know, that whole thing was. I, I said, let me give you a secret. See, her ears perked up. A black secret that most white, that white people don't know. And, and I shared with her that, that, that black people don't like white people more than white people don't like black people. She, she was kind of taken back in a moment, but I said, why, why would they? See, see, the anger and the animosity and the seeming hate that white people has, they, they're, they're simply exhibiting consciously, but from a subconscious motivation of guilt that just has never been dealt with. But, but see, black people are responding in their feeling of hate toward white people based on actually having been done wrong. So the hate that black people have toward white people is legitimate and real. And, and their subconscious feeling is the same, okay? So there was a purity in the hate that black people have for white people where, where there was really not really a purity of hate. It's really a motivation of guilt that white people have toward black folks, and that is simply the reality, man. And so that's where we're at today, man. And if we could just be honest. And so, 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 so even when we find that stuff going on in Montgomery, you got to see those white guys, you know, they were just tripping, you know, out of this conscious, I'm mad, but not really. But them, those black people that came and charged them and all of a sudden just let loose on them, they were dealing from a, a conscious hate and a subconscious hate and they just unleashed on those folks at time. And what I'm suggesting today, and, and, and maybe as a caveat to all of us, is you, the, 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 the sleeping bear has been poked a lot over these past. Black folks have been putting up with a whole lot of stuff. I, I'm telling you, you go into other countries, you know, other regions of the world where people are holding thousand-year vendettas for what your ancestors did to my ancestors, I have to kill you. Imagine if black folks had been like that in America today. There wouldn't be too many white folks left. 
But, but I'm telling you, so, so what black folks have, have, have put up with for so long, I think, you know, what, what we've seen is even, and it has been, you know, we want to say a couple hundred years has been a long time, but really a short time for what we're sharing today. So, so what you've had then is, 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 of course, emancipation in 19, 1865 or so. Then you had the Jim Crow and all that negativity. Then you had, in the in the 1960s, the 50s and 60s, you have the Martin Luther King comes on the scene in the 60s, and and the civil rights movement. You have the King and the Stokely and the Malcolm and 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 the Hueys and all these brothers, you know, come doing their thing from their own particular perspectives. The civil rights movement. Then we had a seemingly okay time in the 70s, you know, when, when it seems like there was almost a quell, almost a peacefulness, kind of. Black people were embracing their blackness with the froze and the black powers and the black panthers and all that. But, but then, it, it, I don't know, it, it, we, the situation had never been made right. It, it was almost like the demilitarized zone in, in Korea, you know, where, where you know, nobody's, there, there isn't peace. <laughs> There's just an agreement. <laughs> There's just a peace treaty right now. You know, the situation never resolved itself. And, and so we you move up, you know, and black people have progressed in the music industry, in the sports industry, in the business industry, in the military. You have generals and, you know, all this everywhere, officers and everywhere, and the politicians as well, and even in business, blowing businesses up and up. But then you had what happened with Obama. All of a sudden we had a black man that became president. Now that was an issue. That that was an issue because because we were never at peace. We just had a peace treaty going on. Okay, a peace treaty is volatile. You know, each side watching each other. You know, Google Korea. You know, watch North and South Koreans looking at each other, just waiting, waiting for the move, waiting for the move. But then that move was made when Obama became president. All bets were off. It went crazy. That, that's when, 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 that, when that negativity from white po folks began to stoke up back in their minds again because the reality of, of the situation in our nation had never been dealt with. If it had been dealt with, it wouldn't have mattered what color the president was, you know, Barack Obama. It wouldn't have mattered if he'd been black or white. It wouldn't have mattered. But the fact that it mattered meant that situation, that subconscious situation had never been dealt with. And now all of a sudden there's that, those emotions again. Now I'm mad again. Make him a one-day pre a one-year pre one for uh, a one-term president. He wasn't he wasn't born in America. He's this. He's that. He's a divider. He's this. He hates America. All this. He's a Muslim. All this kind of stuff, man. All this desperation of craziness begin to come out. The Tea Party was born. There, there were people. There were Democrats. When, when Obama won the primary over Hillary Clinton, there were white Democrats that actually left the Democratic Party and became Republicans because Obama won the primary. Now, what kind of, how, 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 uh, you know, how loyal were they to their party that now that a black man got the primary, uh, was chosen to represent the Democratic Party, these white Democrats actually became Republicans. And then when Obama ran for president, we... <laughs> We had General Colin Powell, you know, leader of the Joint, joint Chiefs of Staff, all that stuff. Man, he, he was a conservative Republican. He came on news and said, I'm voting for Obama. Because this situation right here, it's greater than politics, it's greater than anything. He knew. He, he knew what I'm trying to tell you right now. Yeah, he did what he had to do. He did what he had to do to, to climb the, the echelons to the highest rank in the military, to be a general and be the chief joint chiefs of staff. But he realized this thing right here was deeper. It was subconscious. The whole subconscious of America was floating on this, of white people. <laughs> Man, they were hating on Colin Powell, that's for sure. Obama became president, man, they were pissed off. And then, then he won again. <laughs> Come on, man. And then he won again. Undefeated. Messed him up. That's what, that's what fueled Trump. That's when Trump came on board. This isn't a political message. This is just a recap of his, recent history. Trump came on board, and this is how deep it is. You, you saw when he ran. So he's, he's running against Hillary, right? And, and so what is he saying about Hillary? He's saying Hillary is just a third term of Obama. She, although she was a white woman, he was trying to link it back to the black man to stoke up that subconscious negativity that had never been resolved. And they were pissed. You've seen them? 
Come on, you seen this man? That man, when uh, when Biden won, I guess he's a fourth term of Obama. <laughs> Not a third term of Obama. When Biden won, have you ever seen people climbing over the White House, White House you know, like that? The insurrection, the craziness, fighting the Capitol Police, breaking into buildings, you know, getting shot. The girl got shot and killed. I mean, come on now. Why? Because, because that black man, Obama, drove him crazy. Biden was Obama's vice president. So, so, so it's just like that, that white guy, that, that, that guy that beat his wife, and, and every time he sees her, it brings up those negative feelings. Every time they see Biden, it brings up the, the Obama feelings because that had never been resolved, man. And, and so that's, which I know we went all off on here because we're talking about that Montgomery thing, but I'm just giving some context. So this is what you have going on. You have angry white people that are just angry on a conscious level, but deep inside they're guilty and they know it. They know the truth. They've all had black friends. Whether elementary school or 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 uh, high school or college, if they've been to college, <laughs> come on now, military, they all had black friends. But but on the conscious mind, they've convinced themselves, well, you know, well, Billy was different, because that's the only way they can justify what their conscious feeling is about most black folks, about Obama, <laughs> about Kamala Harris, about every black person. That's it. And, and so you saw how they responded to that guard down there in Montgomery, Alabama. First they confronted him, then they started beating him. Now what would possess grown men, one guy was like a store, a, a convenience store owner, grown successful men to, to all beat up on one guy. Think about that. that. That's not even, that's not civilized, especially for this day and age. Because they're dealing with those subconscious issues that something clicks. And, and this is the person I resent. This is the person I'm angry at. This is the person I'm sorry about. How does that translate consciously? I'm mad at this guy because he moved my boat three feet. <laughs> then you got the other brothers and sisters coming down who have this pure hate, pure hate, pure hate for white people. They let them have it. They just let it out. Let it out. One young brother swam across. <laughs> Come on, man. Can, can, can you see what I'm talking about? The, the sleeping bear is awakening. And, and I'm saying this sleeping bear, let the sleeping bear be something positive in white people. Let white people begin to recognize the source of, of all this negativity that they have is simply some unresolved guilt. And, 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 and because this, 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 there is no unresolved anything with black people. Black people are simply pissed off and just responding like they would have. Now, now the subconscious part, I don't even want to talk about this too deep, black on black crime. Black killing black people, cutting them down, the, the gang bangers, the reds and the, and the blues and all these other ones, you know, the, all that stuff that they're doing to each other. Now, that's a, a, a conscious response of a subconscious injury, but that's not what this program is right now. But, but it's, it's a human condition. They're very rarely do we consciously operate based on th something that we're consciously thinking. Usually we're moved by subconscious proddings. Usually, most of the time. And, and, and sometimes for everyone, okay? <laughs> so so I'm, I'm just suggesting then that we, we, it would behoove us to recognize what's going on here and just try to make things right. Be because as you know, you know, I, I have an affinity toward black people. Now, now there are some white folks in my in my lineage. You know, my great great grandmother was uh, from Ireland, the Isle of Man. You know, she was a white lady, and and my grandfather on my mother's side, Mexican. You know, <laughs> so I mean, so so all of us are a hodgepodge of genetic, you know, whatever mixtures and everything. But the reality is that in, in this nation, I'm a black man, and and so so I think that I don't know, but I would hope that. What, whatever uh, environment I would be in, that I would always be on the side of the oppressed, but I don't know that. I don't know that I would be, but I just know that I am on the side of the oppressed in this nation, and that's black folks. And, and as I was sharing recently, I, I was telling my daughter the other day that her mother and I, me and my wife, we've pulled ourselves out of the reach of racism, out of the effects of racism, and she looked kind of taken back. And then I explained it to her. That, that when, you, when you take care of your business, 
See, see the many of the institutions in this nation, like the prison uh, system and all, have been created to oppress black people. Those are racist institutions. So, so how do you keep yourself out of the reach of a racist prison institution as a black man? <laughs> don't commit crimes. <laughs> don't drink and drive. For me, don't drink at all. You know, even, you know, I want to say, now this would be too deep. Uh, abstract light, but but even ill health, certain issues of ill health, which are pretty much prevalent around the black community, are in in effect um, an institution of racism, <laughs> in, in that we are killing ourselves by the food we're eating. We are killing ourselves by a lack of exercise. We are are killing ourselves physically rendering ourselves unable for the battle. I mean, you're talking about going into war or even a sporting conflict, but going into war and, and who do they send back to the back lines, you know, if you got your foot blown off or if your heart isn't any good, if you got your arm blown off or something. So we are rendering ourselves useless in, as, as soldiers as, as we are not taking care of ourselves physically. So we, in effect, are utilizing a racism against ourselves by sabotaging our own health. That's pretty deep, isn't it? I bet you've never heard that anywhere. I never have. I just made it up. But it kind of makes sense to me. We, but, but however you want to, whatever you want to call it, we are, we are taking ourselves out of the game by, by keeping our, 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 our people are, are very unhealthy. And I think really that, that is prevalent, you know, maybe across the nation of all people, but we are an obese people. We, we eat too much. We eat the wrong kinds of foods. We eat the wrong times of day. We don't ex get enough exercise. We don't get enough cardio. We don't do anything. We don't do anything, and we're killing ourselves. So let me just start off here. If we want to pull ourselves out of the hand of racism, we need to stop committing any kind of crimes, okay? And I want to suggest we need to stop uh, doing any kind of drugs at all, even weed. We need to stop smoking cigarettes. We need to stop drinking alcohol. We need to start eating healthy. We need to start getting exercising. We need to get educated. And we need to get armed. That's how we take ourselves out of the reach of With all this stuff going on, see, my thing, what I'm seeing here, and it's the negativity, is when I see so many people celebrating over what happened in Montgomery, Alabama. And, and I'm saying, so, so making t-shirts, making hats, making all these videos, making these memes or mimes, whatever you call these. <laughs> My daughter hates when I get the memes, right? Okay. I, I'm, I'm saying, is that where it ends? What would you do if that situation had arisen? Would you have run to the help of that gentleman? See, see the point I'm making is we can get so caught up in that thing that happened then, this, this ain't over. What it reminds me of is that brother that doesn't take a, you're going to run the football back, you know, from punt return, and, 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 and just before he crosses the finish line, celebrating, and then he drops the ball and then crosses over, it even a touchdown. Or, or maybe the guys like, like, like Custer at the Little Bighorn, you know, or some of those, those British people when they're fighting the Zulus, you know, you know, got, got this little skirmish, won this little skirmish, celebrating, thinking it's over. They don't see right over the hill, there's thousands and thousands more. We're not there yet. What are we celebrating so hard for? We're not, we're not anywhere yet. We still got a ways to go. They ain't done. They, they haven't been psychologically fixed. You know, the white folks haven't seen a shrink and have come to terms with that issue they have inside. They're still mad at you. We, we've still got this going on. But I'm telling you this. And I've done this all myself. I mean, I'm in pretty good shape for an old man. Why? I start in the morning, I do 80 push-ups. I do 480 moves on a wooden dummy. <laughs> then I do these ab exercises, about 60 of them. And then I do a 40-minute cardio. I eat right all day, okay, till I get home. And then I eat a little bit of this and that. So, so I'm taking care of myself physically. When I was 50 years old, I decided I wanted more than a high school diploma. I decided to get an associate degree. Ended up getting a bachelor's degree. After that, an MBA 10 years later. I got educated, okay? That's, that's what I'm talking about. So, so I eat right, I, I, I exercise, I, I, uh, I got educated, 
I don't break any laws. I'm telling you, back in the day, man, I'd be driving. I'd be nervous if a police officer was on my tail running my license plate because sometimes there'd be a warrant for my arrest or I'd be right, you know, I don't know if I paid a ticket or I'd be right at the points about losing my license. And if a police officer runs my license plate today, there is absolutely nothing on there except I have a CCW. I hope that'd be all right. <laughs> I'm just saying we got to clean up our own act. Oh, armed? Man, a couple years ago, I was watching TV about these apocalyptic, you know, white guys with the bunkers and the bullets and the guns. I'm like, Dad, they got all that? I ain't have nothing. I think I got a kitchen knife in the other room. I'm down at the gun store, man. I own, I own a Glock 19, fourth generation. I, I have a Mossberg shotgun and an AR-15. I mean, I'm not a gun nut. I don't even really like or love guns. But I don't go anywhere without it. And I've had some situations with white folks in about the past couple of years. Recently, about the past three months, when I was driving our little white Spanish student exchange uh, student around, um, I've had situations. But I've had that 9 millimeter right on my lap. I'm just telling you, don't allow yourself to be victimized. Because unlike those brothers down there... <laughs> In Montgomery, I'd be 65 in a couple of months. I'm too old to be swinging. And I don't run as fast as I used to. Always be able to take care of yourself. So, I, so I'll repeat them again. Don't break any kind of laws. Don't do any drugs. Eat healthy. Exercise. Get educated and get armed.